Thanks for attending the webinar today. This is Bill Neville with the Entrust Group, and uh, I'm going to welcome Neil Bawa, uh, who is now this is I think our third um, That's right. presentation yeah. that we've done with Neil. He's uh, he's a local favorite at this point. Anytime, isn't I mean if you haven't seen him talk already, you're in for a treat. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let him get to uh, introduce himself when we get there. Um, but what we're going to be talking about today is real estate trends or what to expect in 2021, which is uh, which is Neil's specialty, very heavily data-driven analysis that he does. And again, I think you're going to find yourself really enjoying this. Uh, before I get into it, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the entrust. I'm going to hand it off to Neil, and then we're going to I'm going to take it back at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll get to those at the end. So go ahead and type them into the uh, questions or chat box, and then. Uh, we'll go through them one by one at the at the end of the presentation. Uh, the first thing you can see up here is our, our standard uh, disclosure that we put up here. It says the Entrust Group. So in a sense, what this says is that Entrust Group is we're not advisors. We don't give advice. We don't give financial advice. We don't give uh, um, tax advice. What we do is we provide all the custodial and record keeping services that allows people to hold non-traditional assets inside the retirement account to hold things other than publicly traded stocks, bonds, and mutual. So we encourage you before making any investments to talk to an advisor, a CPA, uh, tax attorney, whoever you have in your life that gives that kind of advice, but it won't be interest. Uh, so this is the agenda. We're going to talk about interest, then we're going to hand it over to Neil. Uh, then we're, I'm going to talk about the basics of a real estate IRA, um, talk a little bit about a new program we have, a new uh, uh, debit card uh, that you can use inside your interest account. Uh, for real estate properties, and then we're going to have the Q&A at the end. Uh, about me, I've been with the Entrust Group now coming up actually on 10 years in April. Uh, my focus is on educating people on how they can use their retirement accounts to invest in alternative assets. That's essentially what we do, and that's my responsibility as, as business development manager. Uh, and I graduated from Penn State University. We have approximately $4 billion under uh, in accounts with us right now. We have approximately 22,000 accounts. We've been in business for almost 40 years, coming up on 40 years now. And uh, the biggest difference between Entrust and our competitors uh, is that we provide you a single point of contact. So anybody who has an account with us, uh, I'm a regional business development manager. I'm one of four, so anybody, and then we all have uh, uh, associates that work with us. So if you have an account with Entrust, you're assigned a single point of contact. So you don't just call an 800 number and get whoever happens to answer the phone. You have your business development manager and his uh, associate as your point of contact. Um, we are self-directed IRA custodians and record keeper. The majority of our staff is cer certified IRA service professionals. Uh, we have offices throughout the United States. We're headquartered in Oakland. We have a national continuing education program for realtors, financial advisors, and uh, CPA. So, if you're interested in uh, more information about our continued two, two CE credit program, uh, go ahead and reach out to me. And uh, we do lots of in-person events. We do monthly webinars for those of you who are here. And then we have our annual IRA Academy where we actually are the ones who give classes to our competitors on what they need to do to, um, to pass the certified IRA service professional. So we truly uh, believe that we've earned the reputation of the leading educator in our industry. And so on that note, I am going to pass this off to Neil, and uh, he's going to go through his thing, and then uh, we're going to come back to me at the end. So, Neil, I'm going to make Thank you the presenter. There you go. It's your show. Perfect. There we go. All right. And, and guys, because I don't want to cover up the deck, there's a lot to see here. There's a lot to, to check out. I'm going to turn off my screen, and I'll turn it back on when I finish uh, for, for questions. So I'm going to turn it off. Um, you should be able to see my screen. Bill, can you see my screen now? I'm seeing you still at the moment. Hang on. For a second there, I saw your email. Okay. Uh, but now, let's see. Show screen. That should work. Yep. Okay, perfect. All right. So bring this up on the screen. So the name of the presentation has changed a little bit. And as you can see, each year when I present at Entrust, and it, it's a wonderful group, and Bill and I have known each other for a long time. He's come to a lot of my presentations in Fremont. We work with Entrust quite a bit. We have um, a number of customers that have worked with them and had a great experience. 
when we do this presentation each year, we call it Real Estate Trends 2021, obviously at this point, uh, it would be the next year. But this year, I decided to change it up just a little bit because obviously we've got an 800 pound gorilla. It's a black swan event, possibly the greatest black swan event in modern history. So it made sense to pivot the presentation towards real estate opportunities that are sparked by COVID itself because it's, it's affecting the investment forecast in such a massive way. Uh, this presentation is critical knowledge, but this is not Netflix binge watching. And, and I'm not here to scare you, but the fact that you are in this webinar means you're probably concerned about the effect of the coronavirus on the economy, on your own wealth, on real estate. You want data, you want input and decision-making ability, and you want ideas on how you can safeguard your assets. And that is what this presentation is all about. Um, so a little bit, a su super quick intro about me. I am a guy that is super relieved that I actually have no investments in the stock market, which seems to go up and down on, 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 you know, on a lark or in hotels or airlines in particular. I live on the quiet little apartment real estate side of the pond where the investing is not as sexy or addictive, but boy, am I happy today to be the slow and steady turtle, not the speedy rabbit. Uh, these are about half of our apartment and self-storage and industrial communities. When I look at this portfolio, I thank myself for being in an industry where I have the cash flow to cushion the sharp pain that we all felt. We've been checking our community's cash flow, and many of them can actually pay a year of mortgage, even if their rents fall 50%. And we've had no rent decline in the last eight months. So we believe we made the right call when we were buying assets like these, especially the uglier ones that are on the screen and our investors will be able to sleep at night knowing that our tenants need a roof over their head. As all of you know, track record matters more than the portfolio, so it's great that our investors are kind enough to write reviews for us once they've completed projects, like this review from Sarah, who has four active projects with us. Take a look at her review. She's very astute. She's invested with a lot of syndicators, so she can truly speak to our quality and hard work. Ivan's another experienced investor who's invested with us in multiple projects. He's very detail-oriented. He's a technologist. So what he liked about our projects, other than our returns, of course, is our class-leading use of data and metrics to find the fastest-growing cities and neighborhoods in the U.S. So take a look at his review for a second. And before we get to the content, here's the really boring stuff that my lawyer forces on you. Uh, this is an educational webinar. It doesn't squeeze out the risk in, uh, risk in real estate investing. My recommendations are not magic. They're personal opinions. Do your own due diligence. Consult professionals. And understand that even if you do all of those things, you could still lose money. Bottom line, real estate stocks. These are all risk investments. And uh, feel free to type in your questions. I will happily take questions at the end. And I believe you'll get a copy of this recording. All right, let's start this session with some up-to-date data. And numbers tell a very powerful story. So internally at Vocapitus, my company, we're using six different trackers to track the post-COVID recovery. So our first tracker is about jobless claims. And this one needs to be updated because uh, new numbers came in last week. So nearly 12 million people had continuing job claims at the end of September, and it dropped by about a million and a half last week. Now, note that every single week since March has been an all-time record compared to pre-pandemic numbers. Now, it's good that that continuing claims number is dropping, but here's the problem. The initial claims number is remaining stubbornly high. In fact, if you look at this blue graph on the left, it's plateaued since mid-August at over 8,000 new claims a week. Before the pandemic, this part on the left here, new weekly claims were around 200,000. So 200K before the pandemic, millions every week for the for like four straight months and now 800,000 a week. Better than before? Yes, but still staggeringly, stunningly high. The people out there who say that we're past the hump simply haven't seen this graph or maybe they just ignored the data this graph. Our second tracker is consumer confidence. People spend money when they're confident about the economy, when they're confident about their jobs and Optimism suffered a record plunge in April. We are seeing a rebound in September numbers. I just looked at October numbers, they just came in, and that rebound is continuing. So it seems like consumer confidence actually tracks COVID case rates. So we were down in August, we were down in September, and then down in, in the early part of October with COVID case rates. So consumer confidence was spiking. Of course, at this point in time, we've now seen an incredible spike in COVID case rates. So I'm not sure if the happy news on the consumer confidence is going to continue on into December. 
Our third track is gasoline. This tells us how quickly the economy is bouncing back. And here we have good news to report. Oil usage has bounced back close to pre-pandemic levels. Now, some of this is being driven by longer road trips and as people are hesitant to fly. Overall though, this bounce back in oil use is a very strong positive indicator. Our fourth tracker is same store sales. While we saw same store sales decline by as much as 9% during previous months, you see this here, right? There was a bright spot in August, and I'll tell you about it. August, uh, September's not on the chart, but I'll tell you there. There was a bright spot in August. Same store sales, sales actually rose by 5.6% compared to 4.6% from August last year. So actually spiking higher than they were in August last year. So there's clearly some pent up demand there and consumers are buying. September was even better. Same store sales were up by more than 6%. So there's definitely a hunger for the consumer to get out there and start to buy again. Our fifth tracker designed specifically for the COVID era is daily airline passengers. And here the news is bad. We've seen a 75% decline in passengers and that decline is not correcting. Look at the graph, it's actually dipping again, so much so that US airports look haunted. The TSA provides this number daily. So I looked up yesterday's numbers. Yesterday, 902,000 people went through TSA checkpoints. A year ago, it was 2.5 million. So as of yesterday, the drop is over 65%, an absolutely staggering decline. This is going to hurt and it's going to have long-term impact. Our last tracker is home purchase. No secrets here, but the US single family market is on fire. Mortgage applications up 27% from last year. Refinances up 86% from a year ago. Home buying is absolutely critical to the US economy. And it's very fair to say that the Fed did the job that the White House and Congress have really failed to do on the economy. This is by far the most positive indicator. So we've got two indicators so far that are hugely negative, jobs and airlines. We've got two that are neutral, consumer confidence and oil. And then we've got two that are positive, same store sales and housing. Keep in mind though, that the prudent investors who don't wanna lose money will say, Neil, the jobs are the 800 pound gorilla. And I will respond with, yes, you're right. But I think housing is also a gorilla. Maybe it's 400 pounds, maybe it's 600 pounds but it is a gorilla and it's doing phenomenally well. So it's not all gloom and doom in the US economy. Okay, so we looked at the six trackers that Grow Capitus is using to track the pandemic. We got some insights into what the numbers mean. Now let's dive, dive deeper into the crystal ball and talk about the key trends that are affecting everything in 2020 that I think will affect everything in 2021. All right. Let's start with the biggest, most important mega trend of all time. Real estate is again becoming extremely lucrative to investors because the yield premium is the second widest on record. And you're like, what? What the heck is this thing called yield premium? Well, to figure that out, you have to look at my favorite graph, graph of all time. This is the one that really controls our destiny in real estate. This is the spread graph. As it turns out, it isn't presidents or parties that control what happens to real estate. It is the gap or the spread or the margin between the average yield of real estate, and that's here in orange, and the price of 10-year treasury bonds, right? That's here in green. So let's start with the left side of the graph. In 1990, it made no sense to invest in real estate because you could make almost 8% by just buying treasury bonds. And with all the risk that we take in real estate, you were just getting one extra percent. Let me get a, a better uh, laser pointer here. So obviously this is not enough of a yield premium to take the risk. But as things went on, things adjusted to normal levels. Normally, for there to be a healthy real estate market, for, the, for real estate investors to feel good about their profit, this gap, has to be about 400 bips or 4% or greater. And you can see that by 1992, things had normalized and, re and real estate investment made sense again here, made sense here, made sense here, made sense here. And then bad stuff started happening in 2004 because at that point in time, interest rates were going up, but yields from real estate were going down because everything was so expensive. Remember those crazy times, 2004, five, six, and seven. And you saw the result of that. When this scrunches to 200 points, usually there's a real estate recession coming. So then what we saw, 
was the 2008 recession, the Fed lowered interest rates, but real estate yields went up. Why? Because everything was cheap. And so right here, we got to the point which was the highest gap of all time, 580 points. This is the highest we have ever seen in history. And it was phenomenal. And we saw what happened in real estate. Everyone made money. The, the people that knew real estate made money. The people that didn't knew real estate still made money. Why? Because of this boring graph. The spread in premium was massive. And then, of course, real estate started to get more expensive, and the Fed started to threaten to raise interest rates, and then raised them a little bit. And by 2018, a lot of people were saying the real estate party is over. And it was over. It would have been over if the Fed kept raising interest rates, because by that time, real estate uh, profits had flattened out. But then COVID happened. And here we are today, the second widest yield on record. This is why I'm able to say something that will sound truly absurd. Real estate is cheap because the price of real estate is not relevant. What is relevant is the margin or the yield that real estate creates over treasury bonds. And today, that number is extraordinarily healthy. So remember this as real estate investors. And that leads us to our second mega trend that I want to discuss with you. This recession is bizarre. Job losses are not across the board. Some sectors like leisure, hospitality, decimated. Education, healthcare services hit very hard. Oil and gas, manufacturing, big hits. Retail transportation, huge hits. Construction actually did surprisingly well, all things considered. And then you had these three sectors in blue. IT, professional, business services, financial. These sectors hardly affected at all. This means that white collar jobs have done a lot better than blue collar jobs in this recession. And that's bad news for Main Street, but it's good news for the stock market and good news for real estate. But it, because it means that the single family market in the United States is not hurt. Remember I told you the single family market is on fire? 48 out of 50 markets in the US are at all time highs. Keep in mind, that the single family market has to do well for other markets to do well in real estate, for apartments to do well, single family has to do well. So I'm very relieved to see these three blue lines doing well because that's where the majority of the single family owners live and they're surprisingly doing quite well with their jobs. And the truth is that COVID's made me into a liar. You know, for years I've been telling my real estate community that <laughs> jobs matter, but other factors like population growth, income growth, home price growth, crime, they all matter, right? But right now in this bizarre COVID matrix that we live in, the only damn thing that matters in the short run are the jobs. And there is a huge, gigantic gulf in unemployment rates between US cities. Let's ru run through them. Salt Lake City only has lost 1.5% of its jobs compared to before COVID. Phenomenal metro. And, and the Utah economy is absolutely on fire. Austin is protected by its technology. So very small declines in, in uh, uh, the um, unemployment rate or actually increase in the unemployment rate. Phoenix is also doing phenomenally well. Uh, pretty much all of the Texas cities show up here that are doing well in the list. Dallas is here, Austin's here, San Antonio, Houston, all doing really, really well because Dallas's economy is so incredibly strong, which is also true for Atlanta. So that's a marketplace where we've seen big shutdowns happen. We've seen a mayor that is very friendly to shutdowns, hasn't changed the fact that Atlanta is doing well because its underlying strength was so incredible. Surprised to see Cincinnati on the list because the Midwest usually suffers when you have recessions, but Cincinnati has done fairly well. And then you have cities in the middle. These are cities that had significant shutdowns, still doing fairly well. I'd say Philadelphia not doing so well, but up here, Washington, D.C., because of its big government sector doing really well. So Baltimore has a big government sector as well, so it did well. And then you have the cities in North Carolina, which is a state on fire, doing really, really well. Charlotte and Raleigh bouncing back. And when I update these numbers in a couple of weeks, you'll notice that Charlie, uh, Charlotte and Raleigh are actually going to move to the first page. Here's the ones that are not doing well. These are the ones that are doing horribly. Their economies are in serious trouble. At the bottom, you see Las Vegas, obviously that makes sense, Orlando makes sense, but then you see cities that you wouldn't uh, expect to see in this list. Boston is a financial center, but their shutdowns were so aggressive that Boston lost an incredible amount of unemployment. The cities that are hurting the most though are the big dogs, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, 
incredible, incredible loss of employment. I expect to see all three cities. In my mind, these three cities are in a massive recession. The rest of the US is moving out of the recession. So I can't really say that the US is in a recession today. I can tell you these cities are in huge recessions and I don't expect that to change over the next year, year and a half. This is gonna take a very, very long time to dig out of millions of jobs lost just in these three big cities. So keep in mind, this is not an average recession. Not everyone's suffering as much. And the gulf between, let's say, something like Salt Lake City losing 1.5% of the jobs and New York losing 13.5% of his job, that gulf is incredibly massive. Moving on, the third mega trend, of course, is the nationwide eviction ban, right? So the, on September 3rd, the CDC issued an order protecting anyone that makes less than 99,000 a year from being evicted. And let's dig into that ban and how it affects real estate. So it applies to all states. Tenants have to attest that they can't afford to pay rent because of loss of income or medical expenses. They've tried to get government assistance and they've used their best efforts to pay a portion of the rent. They must also attest that if they were evicted, they would either become homeless or have to move in with friends or family. But the protection, it's not automatic. Tenants have to submit a special document. It's a sworn, uh, a sworn statement and tenants who provide false information could face fines or jail time for perjury. Shockingly, tenants have actually proven, uh, been proven that they don't want to, to commit perjury, and a lot of them have been paying rents even though they're not required to. So it's, it's unusual, but it's happening, right? Here's the catch. The rent is still due. It's just delayed. So the tenants have to make larger payments in the first half of 2021 to catch up. And let's talk about what this means for landlords. Just you know, being blunt, the bad news is that the landlords are out in the cold. With this new moratorium, some landlords in this country will end 2020 without having received rents for nine and a half months. That is an incredible hit. And I'm not sure if small landlords are going to be able to recover from that is in a, in a reasonable time frame. Whoops, I think we just switched away, there we go. All right, I'm going to switch past this video. It doesn't play well on GoToWebinar. I'm going to switch past it. All right, as I said, this is hitting the rental industry hard. Unless Congress passes a new emergency rental assistance program, the dominoes could start falling. We could see smaller owners losing properties on a significant scale over the next four to five months. But what's helping is that the single family market's on fire, and that's helping to keep prices from going down. We had projected that by now, the multifamily market could lose five to 7% of its value. We're seeing value losses much lower than that. 2% 2, 2 in certain areas, 4% in others, but we haven't seen any market drop 7%. And a lot of that is because the single family market is doing so, so well. Uh, a lot of you are not Californian. I know interest is based, in, based here, but a lot of you are not Californian, so I'm gonna skip past the California section. And I'm gonna talk about where we are with rent collections in the US, because that's a big deal for real estate investors. Are we collecting rents? And here's the good news. Um, you can see collections in 2020, that's the right half here, so are actually pretty decent compared to 2019, right? According to the National Multifamily Housing Council Rent Tracker, 92.2% of apartments made a full or partial payment by September 27th. This is only one and a half points lower than those who paid at the same point in September last year. All things considered, strong numbers. October came in even slightly stronger than September did. So these are strong numbers. Now they do vary by property size and metro. Detroit, absolutely horrific rate of payment. So is Chicago, where Salt Lake City basically looks exactly the same as it did before. Uh, so does Phoenix. Um, not much of a difference there in, in those metros. So varies by metro, but overall, very, very good news for landlords. And by the way, that was absolutely the best case scenario. All right, I'm going to move on to my, my last and potentially the biggest mega trend for 2021. This is the one that you really need to understand because it can put the most amount of money in your pocket. And this has nothing to do with investing with me. It has to do with you being aware that something massive is happening, suburbanization. It's the trend of people migrating either to the suburbs or to other cities. 
And do keep in mind, a lot of people are thinking, oh, COVID made this happen, so it's gonna go away when COVID stops. And this trend started in 2010, accelerated in the last five years, and then COVID just blew it up. Take a look. So those of you who watch the TV show Shark Tank, you know Robert Hergebeck, right? He's an astute investor. He calls the new suburbia mania the biggest exodus in 50 years. And I have to say, I really agree with this guy. I'm gonna skip past this video again. And here, here's a proof that suburbanization was already happening before COVID. This chart, you see this blue line, that's vacancy rate for the suburbs, for America's suburbs. This is vacancy rates. Um, I, I'm sorry, this is the suburbs up here. This is the vacancy rate for downtowns and central business districts. As you can see, in 2010, the, the central business districts saw a very small spike for the recession, and then they were down here to about a 4% occupancy, and then we, we saw the suburbs at six. So more people wanted to live in the downtowns than the suburbs. But look at what happens. Each year, the suburbs catch up. By 2017, the suburbs and the central business district have the same exact vacancy. So this had happened pre-COVID. There's clearly a move to the suburbs. Cannot be ignored. Now, let's dive deeper into this phenomenon of working from home. As you can see from this table, San Jose, San Francisco, Los Angeles, these cities have much bigger changes coming for them than let's say Jacksonville on the bottom right here because a full 25% of San Jose's renters can turn into buyers if they were allowed to telecommute five days a week. 25% nationwide, nearly 2 million renters could turn into buyers if they were allowed to move to cheaper areas. And as you can tell, many of them have already been allowed to move to cheaper areas and those people are buying, you know, setting the single family market on, on fire. Two million is a stunning number. It's really bad news for landlords in all of these expensive metros that you see here, and really great news for Sacramento, Jacksonville, Atlanta, Tampa, the cheaper metros that people can afford to move to and become homeowners, right? Now, keep in mind, suburbanization doesn't just mean people moving to other metros. No, 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 a lot of suburbanization is about people moving to cheaper parts of the same metro. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, we could see significant, huge price increases in Tracy, Pittsburgh, Antioch, Vallejo, Fairfield, all of these places that are 50 miles away from San Francisco, we could see a very substantial increase in prices. Hired.com recently surveyed 2,300 technology workers. We care a lot about tech workers because they pay up. They said, 42% of them would move from the Bay Area if they were allowed to. 40% would move from New York if they were allowed to. Now, I don't think that 42% of these people would have moved, but let's assume 20% of this 42% move, that's an 8% delta. It would completely, unquestionably forever change the market in New York and the San Francisco Bay Area. Huge changes are coming. So if people move out of larger metros, that represents an opportunity for you, right? Not necessarily with my company, just an opportunity. So as people fire their expensive cities and adopt inexpensive ones, there will be an exodus. And we're seeing it in the last eight months. Did you know that it costs you $1,200 to rent a U-Haul truck from San Jose to go to Vegas, but it's only $50 to rent that same U-Haul from Vegas to San Jose? Isn't that crazy? It's also true. So in the chart above, cities that have high net migration are in the lighter color. So you see Texas here, you see Florida, and then you see some lightness here. This is North Carolina, I believe, uh, North and South Carolina. So you're seeing these places that have a lot of in-migration, and this is being massively accelerated by COVID. On the left side, we're seeing Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and then we're also seeing other states like Georgia and Tennessee doing really well, and they're the winners of this mega trend. Big losers. California, New York, and the entire Northwest. You see how this, this portion of the Northwest is extremely dark on the chart above. Know this because this is the biggest opportunity for you to make money by yourself or with other people in the next 15 or 20 years. And by the way, a lot of people are like, no, 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 this is not gonna happen because the offices are what matters and all the offices, well, they like downtowns. That's where the jobs are, really? Take a look at the same graph, but this time I'm showing you offices. Do you notice 
that America's employers have come to the same exact conclusion over that same exact time frame. Today, suburban office is hot, it's ultra hot. Whereas downtown office, nobody wants to rent. Rents are going down, vacancies are increasing in downtown offices, but suburban office, boy, everybody wants in. I'm gonna skip past this slide and talk about self-storage. And you might say, hey, why, why did you pivot to self-storage all of a sudden? It's like, well, yeah, because it made sense at this part of this part of the story to talk about self-storage. A lot of you guys have, are like, yeah, multifamily is great, but it's expensive. You know, I, I wanna invest in self-storage. You know, so tell me about that asset class. Well, it's doing really, really well because relocations in the United States are at an all-time high. And guess what? When you relocate, you need storage units. Rents have been increasing since COVID. Not not sexy like the single family industry, but slow increases, steady increases. So I think that this sector will continue to do really well. This is this is fairly recent data. It looks like looks like self-storage may be a good place for you to invest in. Probably not with my company, but with whatever company does self-storage. All right. Bottom line, suburbanization, quite possibly the most powerful trend in the last 15 years. There's no doubt that COVID has accelerated this. There's no doubt that we cannot go back to the pre-COVID days of more and more density coming up in big cities like Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. All right, we've talked about a lot of mega trends. We're gonna finish this presentation now by pointing out how the different commercial asset classes are faring. So we gave you a teaser with self-storage. We're gonna show you the other opportunities. But before we do that, I wanna take just 60 seconds to tell you about my latest projects. I'm very lucky to be involved in this 240 unit new construction project in Mesa. Earlier in this presentation, you saw the very powerful data that showed job losses in Arizona, especially Phoenix, amongst the lowest in the US. East Mesa, in particular, has been a standout. It's post-COVID rent growth, absolutely stellar amongst one of the highest in the country. And that's because Phoenix is the fastest growing city in the US and Maricopa County is the fastest growing county in the US. It's also because Mesa is becoming a data center hub with both Apple and Google opening jumbo sized data centers less than a mile from where we are building our apartment project. Here you can see the difference between Phoenix rent growth and the rest of the US. And that really explains why Phoenix is doing so well and the demand for housing is just absolutely incredible. And here's uh, just a couple of the renders of our fully zoned, fully entitled project that's going into construction in a few weeks and we, we've raised about 95% of the equity. Please note that the state of Arizona considers construction to be essential, so we're not likely to see any disruptions from COVID shutdown. So if you're interested in that, please, uh, you, can, you can chat with me. You've got my email address here, neil at growcapitus.com. I have a number of projects like this. More reviews here, but we're running out of time, so I'm gonna skip past investor reviews and finish off with my asset classes. So. We've talked about where some of the asset classes are. We've talked about multifamily. Yes, not very effective. Multifamily is doing really well. Rent collections are phenomenal. Q3 rent collections are very similar to Q2. The, the, the sector that's doing the best of all, and my first tip today for you that are looking to invest, I don't do this. I'm just a passive investor. I invest in other people's medical office syndications. It, med office has been phenomenal. There's basically been a 99 plus percent payment from doctors who are busy because of COVID. And so this sector is doing really well. Office, you're surprised by. You're like, Neil, you're telling us all this bad stuff about office. And the answer is, yeah, but they have five year leases. I expect office to really hurt. But I think it's going to be a very slow moving thing because each year only 20% of office leases come up for renewal or less whereas 100% of multifamily leases come up for renewal. So it's gonna take a long time for office to get hit. The big winner, absolute big winner is industrial. This is one of those least sexy, is very sexy sort of asset classes. But think about this. You know, This is the most important statement I'm gonna make in this webinar, right? And I don't do a lot of industrial. Sometimes we do projects, but it's not my thing. But you should know this. In the last eight months, we have seen eight years of e-commerce growth. Can you imagine if you get eight years of growth in eight months, wouldn't there be a demand increase? And can you imagine what would increase in demand? We're moving from retail outlets to online shipping. 
Well, industrial, logistics, that's what is the primary beneficiary. In March, when I did, or actually in Jan, when I did this presentation for Entrust, you know, that was almost 10 months ago. In that presentation, I said, it's not what I do that's the best in the US, it's industrial. And that was in Jan, that was pre-COVID. But it was already on fire, it was already the favorite asset class, and today it is the massive beneficiary of COVID. Huge demand for industrial. We're looking at somewhere around 2 billion square feet needed just in the next year. 2 billion square feet. Now, on the retail side, all is not gloom and doom because single tenant retail, you know, the, the kind where the, the Walmarts, the, the, the uh, anchor tenants are, is actually doing fairly well. Now, they're not paying all of their rent. Some of the rents have been pushed, you know, forward, but it's doing, there's no debacle there in single tenant retail. The debacle is here, multi-tenant retail, strip malls. This area is going to finally feel what we've been talking about for the last five years, the rental apocalypse. The retail apocalypse is finally here. But it's not as bad as hotels. It's not as bad as hotels. Oops, I'm gonna skip past this. This is the asset class that's the hardest hit, right? Hotel occupancy rates have dropped from the mid 60s to 47% in July. They're up to 49% today. Um, at 29% at down for the previous year, the entire hotel sector in the United States is now unprofitable. Hawaii at 18 and Florida uh, at, and Orlando at 32%, worst markets in the US. Here's what I wanna point out though, okay? This is, this is absolute key. Nothing is fundamentally wrong with the hotel sector. It's not overbuilt. Its occupancy pre-COVID was fine. Profits were high. So in my mind, over the next six months, as short sales occur, and you're going to hear lots, lots about short sales there, defaults occur, the greatest opportunity is here, right? This is where people make a truckload of money if you're brave enough to venture into this market over the next six to 12 months. Speaking for myself, since I don't do hotels for a living, guess what I'm doing? I'm investing in distressed hotel funds like Penbridge, and I'm investing just as a limited partner because I think the returns could be extraordinarily high here. So as for as something, somebody who's just a bystander in the hotel industry, I feel this is 2009 for hotels. It's not 2009 clearly for multifamily, for single family. It's not 2009 for industrial, but it's 2009 for hotels. Don't you wish you had invested into real estate in 2009? Oops, I'm gonna skip past this. And uh, actually we talked about this as well. So that I believe is the end of our presentation. Um, if you can get into industrial investing, absolutely look into it. I do do industrial projects, though they're not very common for us. Most of the time our investors want multifamily. Multifamily itself will continue to do really, really well because because of the fact that we have not been building apartments for the last eight months. I mean, construction basically came to a stop. We needed to build at least three or 400,000 apartments during this year. We probably built 180,000. So, and also companies like me that only invest in suburban apartments, we've never done downtown. We are seeing a tremendous improvement in our occupancy and we're also seeing rents go up. So that is my presentation. Um, I do have a toolkit for real estate investors. This is for people that want access to all of this data. So all the data that you just saw and roughly 10 times that amount, including videos, are at this um, URL. You can use this URL, you can use your phone to, to use this barcode, or you can text to this number. In, in either, any of those cases, you would get access, whoops, you'd get access to my toolkit. So for those of you that wanna keep uh, continue that process, please do so. If you're interested in investing with us, here's my email address and my phone number. We do about 20 of these webinars, just like this one, data packed at Multifamily University. So if you'd like to come to more webinars, Multifamily U, if you'd like to invest, here's my email address and I'm gonna turn it back over to Bill. Okay, thanks Neil, that was great as usual. So I'm gonna remind everybody to, um, to um can you see neil can you see what is real estate ira on your screen is that what, um, what i'm showing right now? let's see um yes okay yes. all right i'm showing the right one um so i'm going to do a quick uh, wrap up here on some things and then we're going to go to your q a so 
I encourage you to type in your questions uh, in the Q&A or chat box, and then uh, Neil and I are going to stick around and answer those. So, um, so real quickly, you might hear the term called a real estate IRA. All that simply means is that it's a marketing term that means that you have an IRA that's holding real estate in it. So uh, when you have a retirement account, you still have to have a, a type of account, such as a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, a SEP, a 401k, something like that. And then if you have that account with a custodian that holds real estate like Entrust and you invest in real estate in it, then that's the term of a real estate IRA. So you still will choose a type of account and then transfer or roll over your money to the account and then you it can invest in real estate. Or in the case of Neil and, and people like him, you're investing in a, uh, a syndication typically structured through an LLC. Um, that is another way to hold real estate, although your IRA is technically holding a private placement rather than real estate. These are the different types of real estate you can invest in, which is really any kind. You can invest in residential, commercial, offshore, uh, notes, tax liens, um, uh, multifamily, uh, farmland, and then you can invest in private placements such as LLCs, limited partnerships, C-Corps, uh, etc. We have recently reintroduced, this is something that we've had off and on over the years as we've changed vendors uh, to try and make it work, what we call our My Direction card. As far as I know, we are the only company that is offering this. And this is for people who are holding real estate uh, inside the retirement account. And so in effect, what you do is you get a debit card where you can transfer money from your retirement account onto that card to use you to pay for any real estate expenses. So uh, this is what it, it, you, the value you get from it. It can save you time, it streamlines your transactions and can help you save money. So. Any, if you hold real estate inside your retirement account and you have expenses like property taxes or insurance or anybody that would take a, a, a card, you can pay those expenses directly from that card. This card is only to be used for expenses associated with the asset inside your, pro, inside your account. So if you hold a rental property, if you hold real estate, you can get a, a My Direction debit card and use that to pay for your expenses. So again, uh, home goods, paying utility bills, property taxes, paying contractors, maintenance, any type of expense that you have, but it's only expenses for the asset itself uh, that you can use the card for. So for anybody who is interested in investing in real estate, if you haven't pulled the trigger yet, if you're not already an existing account holder, which I know we have a lot of those on here, uh, if you're interested in opening an account, you wanna invest in some real estate, we do have this offer. If you go to that website, uh, you can get a savings of $50. We have a new account establishment fee of $50 to open the account. We're waiving that fee. Uh, we have what we call our ultimate real estate IRA library, which is basically a curated um, uh, library of, of real estate investment collateral. So specifically around investing in real estate inside your retirement account. Uh, and then also some exclusive information that you can get about your My Direction card. So we're pretty excited about this. We've um, we've been working on this. Our marketing team has been working on this for a while. It's tough sometimes to find a vendor uh, who can provide the service in the way that we need it um, to allow for individual retirement accounts to have separate cards, but we've found somebody and we're, we're now uh, releasing it and promoting it and we're pretty excited about this. Perfect. Oops. Can I take a couple of questions? I see them in the chat. Yeah, let me, let me, uh, hold on. Um, so, uh, if you want more information on the My Direction card, you can reach out to me. There's Neil's email address. Um, information about today's topic, please do the survey. Everybody is going to get emailed the, um, the presentation, uh, a link to the presentation. And then if you need more information about self-directed IRAs, and then we have uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twit, Twitter, all, all that stuff. Twitter, tweet on Twitter. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to go through these questions. Let me read them, Neil, and then and then, you know, I'll let you know. Uh, we'll go through these one by one from beginning to end. So first one, will we get a copy of the slide deck after the presentation? The answer to that is yes. You'll get an email with a link. Um, so the next question, this is for you, Neil. Is the mortgage application increase for new purchases or refi is let me read that again. Is the mortgage application increase for new purchases or refinance or both? If you presented a combined number, what is the year-over-year uh, -year increase for new purchases? 
27% is the increase for new purchases. 86% is the increase year over year for refinance. So both areas are doing phenomenally well. Um, in fact, the only time that I know we've seen that big of a jump was in 2006. Obviously, that was for different reasons. You know, people were just going a little nuts then. Um, today, obviously, it is because the interest rates have dropped. I, I can't think of any other reasons why people would be going nuts today, except for the fact that interest rates are, they make all the sense in the world for people to buy single them. Okay, next question um, again for you, Neil. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't I be better off buying a single family home in a good area and using a 30 year fixed mortgage? You would be. Um, Howard, one of the things that I never do is I, I don't tell people somehow what I do is better than what you would be able to do by yourself. I find out though, um, and, and this is an individual criticism, so take it for what, it, what, what I'm trying to say here is, when you invest with a fund such as ours, a, a group such as ours, each month you're going to get a checkpoint of our performance. It's gonna be very specific. There's gonna be a graph, a chart. We're gonna say budget versus actual. I've never found a single family investor to do that on their own. They don't have such charts. And so often I ask single family investors, how much money are you making? And they're like, I'm making 12%. And it's like, okay, how about we, we take a $50 bet? You're making less than 12%. In fact, you're not even making 10. I've never lost that bet. So people actually don't do a good job of benchmarking their own progress. But in general, if you can be very data driven, then yeah, it makes sense for you to buy single family homes on your own and get a 30 year loan. That I would say there's nothing wrong with that concept at all. Okay, next one uh, says, great presentation. Uh, I've acquired over 50,000 apartments for a UDR and have owned apartments directly. This is one of the best, um, I need to uh, expand my screen here a little bit. Hold on a second. This was, uh, let me see. It looks like that's just a compliment. Yeah, yep. No question we're, there. We're against this. Like this. It's one of the best yeah. and concise real estate I've gone for you I've ever attended. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the input. Thank right. you, Rick. Uh, if unemployed, any suggestions on how to qualify for a refinance? At this point, because we're in the middle of the pandemic, Debbie, they've really tightened up. So what I would suggest is that you wait for another six months. What, we, what we've always seen is that the government makes an effort to loosen the strings once a recession has been going on for a while. I can tell you that conditions for you to qualify would probably be a lot better six months from now. Today, it's really, really tough if you're unemployed. Okay, next one is about fees for the card, which I don't know the answer to. Andrew, um, if you're there, if you can unmute yourself, do you know what the fees are going to be for the uh, the My Direction card? Hi, Bill. Um, not off the top. I will look and chime back in here in a sec. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I Robert. I don't. <laughs> I didn't come quite as prepared as I thought. I know when we had it this the last time, it was like a twenty five dollar application fee, and then something like three dollars a month um, but we'll find out um next question i have an account and own a rental property how do i go about getting the debit card for property expenses also who and how can i invest in some of the sectors that neil spoke about well i mean as far as getting the debit card um email me and i'll provide you the the information let me uh pull there's my uh, contact information on the screen and, and Neil's contact information on the screen. So go ahead and contact me. Is also, who and how can I invest in some of the sectors that Neil spoke about? Neil, do you wanna? Well, um, so obviously for the sectors that I invest in, multifamily, industrial, um, you're welcome to, you know, my information is on the screen. You'll get a copy of this deck. For sectors that we don't invest in that we that we recommend, uh, you can you have two avenues. One is you need to find your own syndicators or you need to look at real estate investment trusts. So I mentioned storage, for example. I mentioned uh, distressed hotels. A distressed hotel that a lot of people had questions. So I actually plugged in the name of a company that I am investing with. And this is just personal investment. So I, I, I really haven't done as much due diligence as I should. They seem to know what they're doing. It's called Penn Bridge, P-E-N-N -N Bridge. They are in Utah. So you can you can look at them if you're interested in distressed hotels. Um, they're specifically going after distressed hotels. They're not just buying hotels in general. So I like that. Um, storage, there's a number, self storage, there's a number of REITs. So you can actually just go look up storage, R-E-I-T, and you'll see a number of those 
please do your own due diligence. I'm not saying all storage reads are good. I just feel like storage is in a good place because there's so much movement going on in the country. Yeah, and of course, there's always direct purchase, right? I mean, there, there, you know, he's mentioning yeah. some yeah. some markets where he thinks are 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 you know have some some good uh, movement associated with it. And yep. so, you know, you can always just make the choice to to go and travel there and hire a, a, a broker and look around until you find something that you might want to invest in. Um, okay, so we're, 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 we don't have very many questions here. One just popped up, but, you know, we're getting a couple of people who are thanking us. Here's another one. Um, this is for me. Is there a is there a minimum that I need to have in my account to invest in? If you're talking about with Entrust, no, there's no minimum um, that we require in order for you to have an account with Entrust. Uh, as far as is there a minimum for for Neil? Um, yeah, maybe his uh, funds. Seventy five k. So our our projects have a seventy five k minimum. Yeah, and as you're going to find, I mean, if you're looking at doing any working with any syndicators or any REITs or anything like that, most of them are going to have a minimum. A lot of them are going to require you to be a, uh, a credit investor. Like they're going to have their own restrictions. But as far as having an account with Entrust and investing in an account with Entrust, we have no minimum. Like mean, whatever you want to open. Now, you know, understanding that we have fees um, and we have minimum fees. Like our minimum fee is $199 a year. So you wouldn't necessarily want to invest a thousand dollars in an Entrust account and be charged $199 a year. You'd have to get 20% return just to break even. So Sort of bear that in mind from a standpoint of what you're looking to invest. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of rambling at this point because I'm waiting to see if there's any more questions that pop up. We usually get dozens and dozens and dozens of questions and we have a pretty good number of attendees, but I guess the, there was so much, uh, you, you gave them so much information. Knocked it out of the uh, park. Answered all the questions. Yeah. There was or or I stunned really... them. I don't know which one it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. People are still uh, still trying to figure it all out. So I I'm gonna, I mean, we can, though. I'm sorry. Oh, I just have the fees by the way, real quick here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so just my direction card uh, just has a $25 setup fee and then a $9 recurring quarterly administration fee. All right, so it was the same that we had before, $25 and $3 mm -hmm. a month, but we're, we're charging it on a quarterly basis. Uh, okay, let's see. Do we have a group of people that pull their fund to make an investment? I mean, if you're asking that to me as far as Entrust, um, no, we don't. We don't do that, right? We're a service provider that provides the, uh, the custodial and record keeping services for self-directed retirement accounts, and we do. We have created a new platform um, that's called Entrust Connect, where if you're an account holder, you can log in and you can see investment opportunities that are are investments that other interest clients have already invested in. Um, however, you know, you we don't link you up or hook you up with other uh, with other interest clients to to pull the investment. Uh, in a self-directed IRA, what are the tax implications of owning mortgage property? Uh, you're talking you're talking about UBIT or under UDFI unrelated debt finance income tax. Um, so let me explain. Uh, exactly how that works. When you own a, a property, when you own an investment inside your retirement account, it's owned by the retirement account itself, which means it's tax sheltered. If you use leverage to buy that property, so if your IRA borrows money, the IRA is allowed to borrow money to invest in real estate. If the IRA is borrowing money to buy real estate, then a percentage of the income generated by that property could be subject to what's called unrelated business income tax or unrelated debt finance income tax. It's the opposite side of the same coin. So let me re lay out exactly how that would work. Let's say you buy a property for $100,000. I'm just going to use kind of ridiculous numbers here, but you buy a property for $100,000 and that in a year, and you use 50% of your IRA to buy that and the IRA borrows the other 50%. So 50% comes from cash held inside the IRA, 50,000 from cash inside the IRA and the other 50,000 comes from, from borrowed money. So 100% of, of the property is owned by the IRA, but 50% of, of it is borrowed. So in a year, let's say the IRA earns $10,000 in net income. So that means rental income minus expenses like property taxes, maintenance, insurance for a net of $10,000. The IRS looks at that and says, okay, the IRA earned $10,000, but 50% of that came from money outside the IRA, it came from borrowed money, which means 50% of those earnings is not tax sheltered. Only the money that was earned, only the income that was earned 
by the money inside the account is tax sheltered. So 50% or 5,000 of that $10,000 would be subject to unrelated business income tax. It would be subject to a tax. It's, a, it's a, an expense that the IRA has to pay just the same as a property taxes and maintenance and insurance are expenses that your IRA has to pay. Yes. So, you know, I would encourage you not to let, you know, the, the tail wag the dog in this instance in terms of, in terms of, you know, it looking like, uh, you know, getting concerned about it being called a tax. It's just an expense. And so when you're calculating what your return on investment is going to be for that investment, you want to take that into account to determine if you're meeting the appropriate return on investment. And if it changes your return on investment from, I don't know, 15% down to 12%, then, you know, you need to determine if 12% is still good enough of return for you. But I wouldn't get too over, over, uh, overly caught up in the in the fact that it's called a tax. Okay. Next question is for Neil. Do you envision home prices in the San Francisco Bay Area dropping anytime soon? No, I do not expect single-family uh, price reductions in the Bay Area. The Bay Area is now again boosted by uh, by the you know the low interest rates. So unless uh, interest rates go up, which I do not believe is going to happen, we've, uh, we've heard the Fed do something unprecedented in that they've given us two year forward looking view of their uh, interest rate policy. They never did that before. So we, we expect there to be a cushion under single family. We expect there to be a bloodbath in multifamily in the San Francisco Bay Area because the multifamily is not enjoying a lot of those benefits. We are seeing incredible, incredible decre decreases in, in occupancy. We are seeing, um, you know, concessions more than double. Uh, we, we think that there's a bloodbath coming there. We, we think that the real single family market, this may not be the best market in the U.S. to invest in for single family. We may not see much appreciation beyond this point, but uh, we think the market is protected by the, the, the decline in interest rates. Okay, so uh, follow-up question is, was the tax rate? I'm assuming you're talking, talking about the uh, UBIT and UDFI. So it's taxed at trust rates. It's a graduated rate, just like your income tax. So the higher it goes up, the, the, the higher the rate. I, I think it starts at 12%. It's very, actually pretty similar to, um, to income tax in terms of percentages, um, but the, the dollar amount at which it, it, it meets those graduated, those higher uh, are dramatically lower. I don't know the, the percentages off the top of my head. I think it starts, the lowest one is at 12%, and then it goes up from there. Um, but I encourage you, if you just in, uh, Google trust tax rates, or you could probably even Google UBIT or UDFI, and there's going to be somewhere that has tax rates. If you can't find it, then email me, because um, we do have a document where we have the, the trust tax rates. Um, so next question says, thanks, Neil. Agree, there's much concern over pending eviction crisis on lower income housing. Small investors have been taking a beating. Uh, if they are too deeply invested in that asset class, we're expecting to see some price drops as those uh, as those mom and pop investors give up this and skedaddle from the market. Your thoughts as to what tea leaves we should be reading? Well, don't expect any kind of a bloodbath in the small multifamily market. You know, the, the duplexes and quads, we're not seeing evidence of that. Uh, we do expect a significant number of those to change hands, but this is not 2009. Don't get greedy and wait for a 20% decline in that market. You see a 10% decline in, in a property that you like, in an area that you like, go out and buy it. You are not going to see 2009 type declines because there's so much money on the sidelines and the interest rates are much lower. And unlike 2009, when lending wasn't available, lending is very, is, is fully available for the small multi, you know, duplex, quadplex type marketplace. So take your profits, buy, buy if it makes sense to you. Just my, you know, what I'm saying is the tea leaves are not predicting a debacle there. We're predicting some price declines in the small multifamily marketplace and also single family renters. You get a 10% you know, discount, take it because that's pretty awesome given how little you're going to be paying on your mortgage. Okay, uh, next question again, Neil, what are your thoughts on SFR? I'm assuming that means single family residency. What are your yeah. thoughts on SFR inventory in coming months? It seems demand is much higher than supply now than before COVID. Yes, so demand is definitely higher, supply is definitely lower. Uh, I think a lot of that is just the COVID impact and a lot of people just choosing not to move. 
Um, we think that it's going to loosen up in the coming four or five months. A lot of that is dependent on the, on you know the administration of the vaccine. Um, but uh, we expect inventory, uh, you know, supply to move up very slowly. So you could still see price inflation per because we're nowhere near the supply the the uh, supply that we had a year ago. So it's going to take a while for supply demand to balance out, in my opinion. Maybe six months. Okay. Uh, next question: If my Roth IRA buys a property subject to the existing loan, which remains in the seller's name, while the title transfers to my Roth IRA, am I subject to the UBIT? That's a question for a uh, tax attorney or a CPA. Sorry. Um, Next question, what about Los Angeles home prices, Neil? We might see a little bit of a decline in LA home prices, but again, nothing to be concerned about. As I'm saying, San Francisco, Los Angeles, they've had a cushion. I, I think that these places are very lucky. We were all we were beginning to see some challenges there pre-COVID, and now there's a cushion there. Again, with LA, you might not see much price inflation, but I don't see uh, much price deflation happening. Um, so I wouldn't worry about Los Angeles home prices. I just don't think it's the best place in America to invest in right now. Okay, next question. How does COVID affect subsidized housing, also known as Section 8? Well, for the moment, everybody wants a Section 8 you know, uh, housing unit because obviously the government's paying. I want them for my properties in Chicago as well. But I think in the long term, it's a negative impact. Keep in mind that what just happened was that we blew one of the biggest holes in, in statewide budgets in history. So you have places like Illinois that basically are going to need to cut back on their Section 8, 8 uh, housing projects simply because the city is going to run out of money, right? Right now, I mean, the, the taxes that they're collecting from retail are, are so low. Keep in mind, this, this doesn't just end just because we find a vaccine that the trillion dollar budget hole that we've blown, not at the federal level, the feds can print money, they're gonna be fine, but the states can't print money. So there's st significant impact. A lot of section eight programs are state type programs or they're partially funded by the states. So I expect those programs to decline. I do expect the demand for those programs to go up as people realize, oh, if the next pandemic hits us, we'll be covered. But the way pandemics work, you know, you're gonna have one come along in 20 years. So people really shouldn't be thinking that way. But that's just a natural emotional tendency for people to say, let's get more Section 8 tenants. So I think that demand will go up, but I think Section 8 programs will get trimmed or cut. Uh, okay. Uh, next question. If there is an increase in single family home buyers, would that affect the single family rental home market? Yeah, we are, we're seeing that impact. And the short answer is we are seeing rents rise much faster than they would have. We were projecting this to be a slow rent year originally, where we were thinking, okay, one to 2% rent increases. We've seen as much as 7% uh, in the past, even 10% in certain markets. But, uh, but you know, for it, it sort of obviously paused in Q2, and then it started to accelerate in Q3. And we think that Q4, we're gonna see, uh, you know, it's, it's gonna accelerate a little bit further. Now, it truly doesn't accelerate until the eviction moratorium goes off, which we expect is gonna go off in Feb. At that point, I, I, we, we could see rental home prices explode because home prices have gone up so much in the last you know, six months, but there hasn't been an increase in rental prices. So I, yeah, there's, there's some pent up demand there. So you could see a significant increase in rents. Okay, so this last one, this was a follow up to the one where I thought SFR stood for single family residence. It says it stands for short sales and foreclosure rates. So I don't know if that changes your answer. Um, if you remember what the, question was yeah you know, about SFR. I'm not sure I have a full understanding of the question, so I'm just I'm not gonna comment on that. Yeah. Okay, and that was the last question, which is, you know, we're we're uh okay, here's another one. Uh okay. Neil, are sin are syndication investments a buy and hold strategy or do they provide income as well? So uh Syndicators usually will do different length projects because I have some people that think 10 years is the best, you know, buy and hold strategy. I, some people think five and some people think three. Uh, so we offer all of those. You get to pick and choose. Some people hate 10 year projects because they don't get the big pop of the sale for 10 years. And others think three years is just a waste of their time because they want their money to be invested in longer. So uh, it's, it's more like a buffet situation. You get to pick. Okay, uh, Orlando real estate market keeps expanding with new construction. Do you see prices dipping in the near term with the all with all the park layoffs? And what do you see for the long term? 
In the short term, I see a dip coming in Orlando. I think that the Orlando market hasn't fully absorbed the damage yet. Uh, market will continue to see damage. Now, obviously, on you could see a very bizarre situation where the single family market keeps expanding because of the extremely low interest rates and the fact that Orlando has you know, 30, 40 people coming in every day, which is a huge um, number of people coming into the Orlando market. So you could see this two-way scenario where you have you know, multifamily getting hit, uh, single family doing well because because of interest rates. Um, you could see it, some weird price dips, like you could see price dips near Disney where there's expensive homes, but you might not see price dips further out where uh, the homes are reasonably priced and they with, with interest rates, people can afford the mortgage. So it's going to be a very uneven market in Orlando. Now, the long term, your question, I think Orlando is a phenomenal long term investment. I've never invested in Orlando. I don't have a project coming up. I think it's a phenomenal market to invest in for one simple reason. Portions of Florida will be underwater in 30 years, which means institutional will stop investing in portions of Florida in five years. Orlando is inland, doesn't suffer for direct, uh, from direct hits in, in category five hurricanes. I think more money is going to start flowing inland in Florida in the coming five years, in the coming 10 years, as more and more people realize that some parts of Florida are going to become uninsurable, right? This is not an immediate thing. I can tell you the impact of climate change is much faster than the actual impact because insurers are already starting to hike prices and they will hike them like crazy over the next five or 10 years. Orlando is probably going to have the least impact. All right, uh, what are your thoughts on flipping opportunities? Anytime a market is extremely hot, flips make sense. So pick markets that are seeing extreme price increases. Boise, Idaho is a phenomenal market. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area is always a dangerous flipping market because it tends to turn on a dime. So I'm not going to comment on that. But in general, any market that has extreme price increases, extreme means 10% a year or greater, are great for flipping opportunities. If you know how to flip, keep, keep at it, man. All right, very good. Neil, as always, it was tremendous. We appreciate uh, every time you come on and provide such great information. I want to thank everybody who joined us. Um, we have another webinar coming out next month. I'm sorry, I don't know what the topic is, um, but look for uh, look for emails about that. And, and if you have any questions for me, there's my contact info. If you have any questions for Neil, there's his contact info. Neil, thanks again. Everybody enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.